find something to stop to shut up. <laughs> Yes, how's it going today? It's going great, Yannick. Thanks for joining me to talk about your film, uh, Mondo Hollywood Land. And uh, I guess the pitch is a psychedelic guide to Hollywood. Boy, is that a great description of this film? <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's yeah, basically kind of is uh, an homage to these kind of '60s, uh, '70s psychedelic films that I you know was grew up watching and stuff like that. And it follows this uh, you know mushrooms dealer who traverses around Hollywood and. And uh, tries to find the meaning of Mondo. So yeah, it's kind don't of a forget crazy psychedelic ride. And the man from the fifth dimension. Don't forget him. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, because I was as I was watching this, I thought of those exact kind of films too. I saw, I bet I watch them on Turner Classic Movies. You know, they have on TCM Underground. They show all those psychedelic films from the '60s, and and I just think and that's why I'm dying to ask someone like you who makes an experimental film is that there's definitely a framework to this movie, you know, but I'm just saying, where did all those images come from? Are they, are they dreams? Or are they just influences? Because some of the stuff is so out there, but you know, someone can't sit down and go, okay, I'm going to just, it's just got to come naturally. So what is your thinking process when you create a film like this? Um, well, a lot of the kind of like, uh, like the origin of it all came from this, uh, this screening of uh, Bondo Hollywood uh, that pre uh, Paul Thomas Anderson presented at the AFI Film Festival in like 2014. And uh, I watched it and was like, oh, what if I did a VR version of like Hollywood? And I was originally going to do this, you know, VR was kind of this like thing that was happening. Uh, and then I was like, oh, what if I did that? And I, you know, and I was just going to do this, basically this narration over VR. So you kind of felt like you were the man from the fifth dimension. And then I kind of, I got rid of the idea. Um, I was really uh, fortunate enough to get some like advice from, uh, from Francis Ford Coppola even. I used to like bother his, um, his team to be like, can I speak to him? Can I speak to him? like years ago. And uh, cause you know, obviously this, the, it, this project started a while ago and he was like, you know, don't worry about the tech technology or any of those things. Just make a story and don't worry about like the camera you have or like, you know, I didn't have money to have like a red or an Alexa. So I just, said, okay, I'll use my iPhone. So I started just shooting stuff. And then uh, um, Chris Blim, the lead in the movie, me and him uh, kind of started teaming, we teamed together to kind of start writing it more of as a narrative film. So a lot of these crazy kind of psychedelic imagery uh, really came from when me and uh, Blim would really just sit down and start writing out uh, scenes and so on. And then Marcus was another co-writer who helped kind of, you know, structure it more. So there was that kind of under, uh, like underneath all the craziness, there was a base of uh, formula, you know. Yeah, because you tell the stories of the Titans, the weirdos, and the dreamers. You kind of have those yeah, there's like eight. There's like eight three-act yeah. structures going on in kind of uh, in this movie. So it's really, it, it actually is weirdly complex, but like, you know, you're not supposed to really be conscious of it. You're supposed to just go along for the ride. But like underneath it, we, we wanted to make sure all three of us as writers to make sure that there was like a, you know, a foundation. And, and usually for experimental films like this, they're usually on a short film subject. You attempted a feature. Was that more of a challenge to, to keep this kind of trip going for, for a full length feature? No, if anything, it... If anything, it was, um, yeah, it was much harder because like, because like ultimately like it was this kind of sprawling thing. Like the script is like, if I remember we, we would write a lot as we were shooting. So something would even happen. And then like in real life and we would say, oh, let's we'll rework the screenplay around this. You know, like uh, there's a few like set pieces that were almost accidental. So we were always writing on the fly. But no, like if you look at the, now, we looked at the script because like the um, the Academy uh, Awards, of, uh, the Academy of Science Motion Pictures asked for the screenplay. So we're like, oh, we have to actually like get this. What's where's this actual screenplay? And it ended up being like it's like 140 pages. So yeah, it was it was a really it felt like a, a lot of vignettes. It felt like a lot of short films. But ultimately, there was this large large story about Boyle and his like crazy journey, and then having to do the Titans, Weirdos, and Dreamers. So it was a lot to kind of. Like the original version was like two and a half hours, you know, oh. so we have to like keep cutting and cutting. But as, as the creative force behind this movie, you know, you know what you want, you know what the writers and what you're trying to interpret. How do you convey that to the actors? Because there's so many day in the life scenes in this movies, in this movie. And also viewers have to keep an open mind because this is not structured beginning, middle and end like a normal movie. 
right. you know, so this is some, this is, you know, uh, artistic endeavor to the, the, to the core. So how do you interpret that to the actors? Do you give them like a free lane and say, look, here's the essence of this scene, or this is what I want you on. Let's just see what happens. Yeah. So I have to say, I was extremely, we were, but we were all extremely fortunate to have really, really great actors who really trusted us because so many times it would be like, here's the scene. And they're like, where does this fit in this? Like, what is this film? And so it, it was, we were lucky to have really like uh, just actors who were, were, were really talented, very talented with uh, improv and all those things. But yes, I think ultimately what we want to do is we want to set up, okay, what's the spirit of the scene? And then we would kind of hone in on it, and throw some kind of, you know, stuff that maybe we wanted to try out or maybe the actor wanted to try out. So we use a lot of people from UCB, from improv, um, like a, a pretty decent chunk. And then it was, so everything was kind of uh, collaborative. Like we always wanted to make sure that like the actors had their input and, out, and obviously that made it so much better because they're going to be able to do stuff way better than uh, I'll ever be able to write. You know what I mean? Like a funny comedian. So, right, right. so a lot of that came from the, came from the actors and they just kind of trusted us and we trusted them and, and then just kind of shot a lot. I mean, it was shooting on a phone too. So it didn't feel so like finite. We didn't, we were shooting on film. You're we like, okay, here's, we were just always kind of, rolling you know right and, and since this was essentially an LA story did you was this guerrilla style or how did you make this film was it on the legit or did some scenes you were like with your phone right it's like okay guys just walk down the street and how did you prepare oh, it was all almost none of it was really legit. I mean like yeah it was all guerrilla because it was, it was on a phone and, and if we had a the uh, you know Alexa or Red or like you know like a real DP you know I, I shot it I'm, <laughs> I'm not a DP then it would be impossible to kind of do. I mean, I don't even know how you would even, because so many of the times we would, even if we'd be like out at a bar with my friends who were in the movie, kind of like, oh, let's do a scene right now. I mean, you just wouldn't be able to do that normally. Or like, uh, you know, just have, having the camera to be in your pocket at all times, 24 seven, and then having your friends be in the movie, it's just a totally different way of making a movie. It doesn't, it, like there's no, there was a schedule, especially towards the end, like the heist stuff. And like, like that was a little bit more structured, like a shoot, but there were parts, like I'd say a third of the movie is like, or maybe a, a four, like a fourth is like, just was really spontaneous shooting and stuff like that. And, and tell me about the first time you showed your first cut to an audience or to friends or family. And what were the, what was their reaction? Did you prepare them or just said, open your mind and just let it happen? Oh, it was, there's actually a screen that was like horrifying. I think I call it like, uh, you know, what is it? The um, Bloody Friday when Nixon, uh, yeah, I call it like Bloody Bloody Sunday, I think. Because it was like, I remember people being like, what is this? Like, what, what, like, <laughs> and I was just like horrified. I was like, oh God, like this, none, none of this makes sense. So yeah, that, that was, that was scary. <laughs> but like, but it was good because it's like, oh, okay, well, what kind of did, what what is confusing like I remember like even earlier on in screenings a lot of people this is you know shot a while ago and then we were cutting for a long time so it, some actually external factors change how audiences perceive it because earlier on I remember Antifa I, people would have to be like people like well I don't know what Antifa is you have to explain that now I don't need to put in a title card to explain what Antifa is because over the past two years they've obviously that's that's become a more social issue that people I mean the Fox News is you'd think that Antifa is gonna just just come and destroy our how you know our, this interview right now so like it's so also like some of external factors changed out a little bit too but yeah earlier on there was some screenings where people were like this is crazy and then there were some that people were like oh this is this is wild and fun but there was a lot of, it was a lot of screenings and editing over like a, a over a year so it, it we chipped away at it I mean, this is film as an art form in its, in its rawest, purest form, you know? So you're gonna have someone look at something and look at this film and go, wow, that was really, you know, wild and out there. And other people, like I said, are spoon fed beginning, middle and end. They don't understand things like this. So it's, it's so interesting to find a filmmaker who makes an experimental film because it's so bold and brave, you know, especially a feature length film. But you have a champion in, in actor James Cromwell. I mean, he, you know, I spoke to him last week. He said such great things about you and about your vision. And he was, he's a champion for you. So tell me about how did that relationship come about being him being the executive producer? Yeah. I mean, he, he's the best and, and, you know, and, and, and uh, I should say too, it's like, you know, doing the boldness of an experimental film, but, you know, like I said, it really does take a village. Like it, it, it's, it was a vision of all of us, right. It was you know, Chris Blim is the producer on the film, co-writer star of it. Really me and him, 
push to make something unique. And that was so much of what his voice was because he is such an abstract and interesting way of, of, of creating things like, you know, really brilliant in that, in that, in that respect. And like Marcus to the writer. So no, I really took a village to make something like this. So I would, wouldn't say it's one person's vision, but yeah, I was really fortunate to have a lot of cool talented friends, but Cromwell is, yeah, he's, he's awesome. I mean, uh, I, I first reached out to him um, in like 2013 because I made a, uh, for years I was making a documentary on the war, a war on terror and the war in Afghanistan and all that and how it impacts civil rights and civil liberties at home and kind of the botched foreign interventions. And, you know, that wasn't, this was during Obama's presidency. So it wasn't like, wasn't the most popular take, you know, really like pinpointing his like Libya, botched Libya effort, his surge in Afghanistan, the drone strikes. You know, it wasn't really like, it was kind of not talked about too much. There's obviously a lot of great journalists like Jeremy Scahill and like Michael Hastings, the late Michael Hastings. But like, it was, I was like, okay, well, I need maybe somebody in, in, the, in the industry to maybe help and, and put it out there. So Cromwell responded and he said he loved the film and he wants to help champion it. So he helped me out so much with that. And then with this, it was a whole nother can of worms because I was like, who would back this thing? You know, I don't even know, this is nuts. And I sent it to him kind of like, oh, he probably wouldn't want to put his name on something like this. But I, I don't know, I, 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 he's just the man. I mean, I, he, I was so excited when he wanted to come on board and champion the film because he is so respected. Not only is he such a great actor and an Oscar nominated actor and all these great films, but he's like a real activist. I mean, yeah, like on, on the ground, like, really doing the work and and i i'll always admire I, I'll, I look up to him for that in many respects so well you know that's just the icing on the cake you know congratulations on this movie man it's 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 a trip and uh, i love being challenged because i see so many movies a year that are just and i love movies like this so congratulations on it and then i wish you the best of luck with it yeah thank you so much uh jeffrey thanks so much for uh for taking the time to interview both of us i really appreciate it